Benjamin Franklin once said that uh, when the well is dry is when we will understand the worth of water. So the next time you see pictures of parched fields and women carrying pails of water looking harrowed, please, please, please do not turn the page or switch the channel. The well near you may be drying up just as fast. The nation water stress rankings by the World Resources Institute says 17 countries are facing extreme water stress and India is 13th uh, on that list. That's quite higher ranking on a global level. 600 million people uh, face this extreme water stress in India. Over 200,000 die every day because they do not have access to safe water supply. Well, those are the figures when we talk of the kind of impact this water crisis is having on a country as large as India and as populous as India. Um, the country's water demand is expected to double by 2030, so all stakeholders, whether it's the government, industry, you and me all have to come together to make that move, start saving water, start, start reusing and recycling water. The government has, uh, for one, started on a massive plan. They have a plan now. Um, you know, they've uh, drawn up a list of 100 water-stressed districts. They have a 300,000 uh, uh, crore rupees program on a Jal mission, Jal Jeevan mission, where they intend to bring piped water to everyone, bring water for irrigation to fields. That's a massive, massive plan. Uh, but is that enough? Is only the government moving on that enough? Now, I have an illustrious panel here uh, from industry, from finance, uh, from people who worked with the government and people who are working with various stakeholders across the world to help us bring some sustainable and scalable solutions. Uh, first up, I'll start with Pierre. Um, you know, the government has drawn up a large plan. It's a, it's a massive 300,000 um, crore rupee, lakh crore rupee plan. Do you think we are late on to starting on that plan right now, considering the crisis has hit us so hard right now? I don't know if we're late or not, but uh, at least uh, like every other uh, resources we have on this planet, we have to take care of water. And uh, water is probably one of the most difficult uh, resources. Uh, first of all, all of us, we, be we believe this is something given. We don't even think about it. Nobody think about water. But water is very complex. And uh, like everything, what's going on today, we need to, we need to introduce natural resources. Like uh, it's been explained just before by Greg, is that the resource that we have is part of, we have the hair, to breathe, and we have the water to live. And water is one of the given that we need to live. If without water, we can't, there is no more life. So there is a right first. So we need to consider the water as a right. And so we need to see that everybody needs to have access to this water in order to survive. So there is first, if we want to put that in economic terms, because at the end, is, we have to think about economics. And we come to the economics of value of water, like many other resources coming from nature, we do not monetize them at the right price. So if we have to put a price, and today we have to put a price on the water, if it's something to live, everybody needs to have access to it. But we need to put a price for a farmer to grow, then we can start to question. And if we need to put a price on water for an industrial person to make something, cement, steel, uh, any kind of uh, leather, you cannot imagine, even a beer. You know that you need 20 liters of water to make one beer. So if we think about that, how much the industrial we pay for it? Nothing today, in any country. Putting a price to water is what will actually make it valuable, is what you're saying. So what I say is that we need to distinguish, and this is the difficulties, the water, which is a right, we need to find a system to give to everybody, because it's the drinkable. The drinkable water, it's more or less less than 20% of the overall water that we need on the planet. It's the smallest part. Right. What is used for industry and agriculture is, is the rest. Yeah. And this is what we need to see, what kind of business model we need to put on that. Right. And this is something that needs to be discussed between the private sector, the public sector, 
And this is why we have this panel today, because there we will see the different point of view from different people. And then at the end, maybe we can talk about the way to finance, and I will give you some ideas on that. Sure. Kavita, let me bring you in into the conversation. The 2030 Water Resources Group is focusing on the various aspects that need the attention right now. For a, for a country like India, with the immense challenges that we have, particularly on the impl implementation side, what, according to you, are the key areas that we need to first pay attention to when we are talking of this water crisis and what the government also needs to look at? Thank you, Archana. So uh, before I get into uh, the question you asked, a little bit about 2030 Water Resources Group. We were conceived in the World Economic Forum in 2008, moved to IFC in 2012, and since 2018, we are being hosted by the World Bank's water practice. Uh, we are present in 14 countries, including India. Maharashtra and Karnataka are our very large states that we are presently working in. And we work on a multi-stakeholder platform, just like Pierre mentioned, which basically means that we are trying to raise collective call to action on sustainable management of water resources, uh, because we believe that uh, you really need every stakeholder, which is the government, the private sector, civil society, and academia, to raise collective call to action. Uh, currently, we are working in three leadership areas, which includes transformation of value chains, which is primarily in agriculture, because that's where most of the water is consumed. I think 80 to 83 percent of the water that India consumes is used in agriculture. So that's one of our primary leadership areas. The second one is around building a circular economy, which is basically trying to focus on wastewater reuse and management. Um, and the third one is around building resilience and water security. So I think these are our three focus areas in all the states that we work in. Um, and I think coming on to your point on, uh, I think because agriculture is where most of the water is consumed, what we're doing is in the states that we're working in, which includes Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Uttar Pradesh, we are working in the areas of uh, command area water productivity and also looking at rain-fed areas where we can look at working in building livelihoods and water security in rain-fed areas and in the area of uh, uh, wastewater reuse and management. Um, so I think that's, that's the work that we're doing in India. Uh, we have a global governing council, and we, like I said, we work on a multi-stakeholder platform where we have the chief secretary in each of these states heading the steering board. Uh, so we work basically on policy-related issues, as well as trying to look at demonstrable ways in which we can actually uh, make things happen on ground. Uh, on wastewater management, are you all also, with the states that you're working with, are yeah. you working on programs where wastewater is being recycled to be used for agriculture? Yeah. Is that a, a model yeah. also that you're looking so at? So we've just, in Maharashtra, very recently, we've, under the ages of the Water Resources Group and the Steering Board, uh, we are looking at a government resolution, which will basically say that there is already a policy that exists. And I think we pioneered the first state policy in Karnataka. We're looking at the same thing in Maharashtra as well, but primarily looking at wastewater reuse in agriculture, in industries, and also for ecosystems. And to collaborate or to corroborate what we're doing through the government resolution, Archana, we're also looking at a pilot in Aurangabad. So we did visit, uh, you know, Aurangabad is one of the drought-prone uh, districts in yes. Maharashtra and Maratwada, as we are aware. Mm. And uh, we're working with the district, uh, you know, the district team and the Aurangabad Municipal Corporation, along with the project on climate resilient agriculture, which was conceived by the World Bank and funded by the World Bank, uh, to look at basically reusing wastewater, treated wastewater in mm. agriculture using the community. Right. I mean, building community, uh, you know, involvement in that. Aurangabad particularly, I think, is one district in India which is drought uh, prone, yeah. which is dry, yeah. but also has the largest number of bottled water plants. Every two kilometers, you'll find find a new uh, a brand of bottled water. So that's uh, one big uh, yeah. challenge area yeah. in some, yeah. some of the districts. Yeah. Uh, I didn't plan it this way, but somehow all my panelists have been seated in the way I wanted to go to them <laughs> for questions. So uh, Dr. Duan, um, you know, she spoke about agriculture being the largest um, largest sector that utilizes groundwater. We use large part of our fresh water uh, for agriculture. 83% uh, of groundwater is being used for agriculture. A large part of this is to be blamed on the Green Revolution or, and some on the food policy that we have. Uh, the entire usage, it's 83%, but it is unregulated and it's inefficient. How do you look at that and what, in your sense, has to be the solution going forward? Asna, I think we need to go back a little and see, yes, 
the biggest use of water is agriculture, and yet we have a whole lot of agriculture in India which is not able to or produce the land which is not irrigated perennially, which is dependent only upon rainfall, despite using 85 percent or 83 or 85 percent, we continue to be water deficient in agriculture. It is in some ways a paradox. One, we have about 1,200 millimeters of rainfall in a year, yet we use, you know, if you measure it in terms of volume, just 6% of the water which comes through precipitation is actually used in India. The remaining 94% is allowed to run off. So whatever nutrients are there in the soil, those also get washed away every year into the, rea into the rivers and then subsequently into the ocean. It, then this is much more in certain parts of the country particularly the so-called seven sisters of the Northeast. There, we don't have much of agriculture, mm. but we have a whole lot of rain, which is much more than the average 1,200 millimeters. Whereas in the agriculture bowl, be it Punjab, Haryana, Western UP, they are always deficient. Having said that, I think the way forward, since you asked me that question, is how to preserve conserve the, a greater portion of the water coming through the coming in the monsoon months mm. or through rainfall that means it has to be conserved where it falls at least not exactly the same spot but planning it on the basis of a watershed area mm. that means you have to be doing bunding of fields you have to be doing bunding is kind of putting the Dr. Dua, fields the around. The, the government has these programs, but they've really not been too useful on ground or efficient yeah, for that yeah, matter. You're right. Certain states certainly not much use. In mm. Maharashtra, where we are sitting, one of the major achievements, yet we continue to be a drought-prone state, mm. because yeah. it used to be only 8 or 9 percent of our area in Maharashtra was perennially irrigated. Mm. Now we see it about 24, 25 percent. Right. That's still below the national average, but the, the employment guarantee scheme started in Maharashtra way back in 1973 for rural areas to give, a, give jobs to at least one able-bodied person for 300 days in a year has helped this. What I'm looking for are the two missions which you talked about for which a funding of three trillion rupees has been made during the current years, 3.06 in fact, mm. is that they have two components. One is called the drinking water mission, the Jal Jeevan mission, under which by 2024, the central government hopes to have a water tap, one connection, a drinking water supply connection in every household of the country. Right. And that's a huge task. We have 149 million households in rural areas which do not have such a facility. Second, there is also under this mission a, pro a project launch called Bhujal Yojana, right. Atal, named after the ex-Prime Minister, mm. Atal Bhujal Yojana, which is how to look after our groundwater. Whole lot of things have to be done. I think the provisions which have been, which are being made here, must get used for making this conserving water, the rainwater, where it falls on the basis of watershed. That's number one. Right. Second and a more important one is if we price our water properly, a point which Pear raised. Today in India, the average price for water is one cent a cubic meter a cubic meter being a thousand liters, which is probably the lowest water rate in the, and anywhere in the world. That in no way reflects the cost of producing it, its opportunity cost or marginal cost even, leave alone. That has to be done well. The moment you do that and combine it with that the government not giving price support 
for, for two or three crops all over the country, wheat, paddy, and state-wise, it's for sugarcane in certain states. All of them are water guzzlers. Hmm. They consume far more water than many other crops, which actually those water crops or other crops which are there are the, what the country needs now. We know, don't need so much of wheat, we don't need so much of paddy. Hmm. Because all of them are what farmers don't use it. It goes up under the minimum support program of the government into the public distribution, distribution system. system. It rots in the go-downs and then ultimately if the rodents haven't eaten it in the go-downs, it goes to cattle. We have to be moving to the nutrient or the protein food which is pulses, oil, fruits, eggs, you know that that's a separate thing. But the fact is if you get those crops growing, they will be consuming much less water and yet be able to use so from the soil and water more optimally. Right. So from moving farmers, uh, basically changing their cropping pattern to move from more water guzzling crops to lesser water guzzling crops is one uh, uh, program. But sir, you spoke about the government spending a lot of money on water programs. Yes. 11,500 crore rupees for Jal Jeevan mission, but 90,000 crore rupees for setting up or uh, going ahead with the large irrigation projects that, uh, that, that have been lying pending. But the utilization of the irrigation channel, uh, canals and programs have not really been that great. That's an extremely so, important point you've raised. Every government, be it a state government, and we have 30 of them now, the, or sorry, Jammu and Kashmir is no longer a state, so back at 28 now, uh, or 27. The, the, every state government, bureaucracy, or their water boards wants to go in for a major project, medium project. And then they forget that creating water storage systems or multi-purpose dams, which get used for power, etc. also, is not by the end in itself. What you have to be doing is not merely thereafter the canal system, and more than the canal, is the last mile connectivity, which is through these channels. Uh, channels which have to be constructed locally, channels which have to be maintained by the communities, and also channels which the farmers use, use the water for, but after it is metered. Right. It is not free for the farmers forever. They, they don't even pay for the electricity which gets used <coughs> for the pushing the water in the farm. canal system right. Right. or from the canal in pipelines to, to their farm. Right. So unless this entire mechanism is put in motion, I think we would continue to have one of the lowest water efficient irrigation system in the country. Right. Somebody is estimated, and in India, most estimates of the government are, you know, I'm not saying suspect, but they can be said to suit, they can be made to suit an occasion or an argument. Media didn't it is, that. no, I didn't. You, you didn't, sorry, I did. It is our, all these dams, irrigation projects, water efficiency is just 38%. Right. Potential to go up by 62 percent, that's the headroom if we actually make these last mile Distribution, distribution channels distribution need system. to be in the focus when the government is looking at irrigation programs and spending large sums of money there. Well, let me bring in Tom Williams into the conversation. Tom, you're working with various in, in various countries across agriculture, industrial use of water, as well as domestic. Um, Dr. Duat spoke about how unregulated and inefficient the use of water uh, in, in India is, and we are not even uh, you know, efficient when it comes to yields per cubic meter of water that we are using. Um, what are some of the solutions that you are using um, you know, in your interaction with stakeholders uh, that you think could be sustainable solutions uh, on the agri side as well as on the industrial side? Thank you very much. Um, you know, victim, uh, water has always been a victim of broken systems and poor public policies, poor agricultural policy, poor economic policy, poor industrial policy, for example. So if we're going to address the water crisis, it has to be through the lens of systems and it has to be through the lens of public policies, not just water policy, but all these other policies. And if we look at 
the food system. Last year, the Eat Lancet um, uh, published a, a report which was looking at how we transform the food system to one that is healthy and is sustainable. And if we make that transformation, we stand to gain 30% efficiency on water. This is through reducing by half um, food loss and waste. This is through dietary shifts. And this is through changing agricultural practices, for example. And if you zone in on those agricultural practices and you, you just select two crops here in India, you look at sugar and rice, that's about 50% of water use in, in yeah. India. Now, there's huge policy changes that need to occur in terms of growing those crops in the right place, where there's, there's suitable value chains in place and where there's adequate water, for example. But in the meantime, you need to manage the here and now. And one of the effective tools that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is pr promoting are, are standards. For example, we have the Sustainable Rice Platform Standard. We have the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard. And essentially what this provides is a framework for business and farmers to understand what it means to grow rice sustainably, including water, including livelihoods, including uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So these standards are in place. They're being um, uptaken by many agribusiness and many farmers. The trick now is to incentivize and to reward their implementation, whether that could be through financial incentives, for example. Um, but the uptake is, is certainly growing, so that's one solution. On the issue of irrigation, um, I think people sometimes um, uh, talk about irrigation as the silver bullet as it relates to water efficiency. But irrigation needs to come with many different enabling factors to make it effective. And I think one of the most critical is around data and information. Those who are using irrigation systems simply don't have the data and information at hand to use it effectively. Uh, around this time last year, I was in Jalgaon um, visiting some farmers, um, understanding how they were using water in their farms. I spoke to one farmer who was piping water from another piece of land three kilometers away to his land. As the, the gentleman said, uh, the energy was free. The water was free. What he didn't know is that the groundwater level is, is critically low there in Jalgaon. So with the information that he had, which is free water, free energy. I don't know what the groundwater level is. I wouldn't be having a rainwater harvesting pond uh, on my farm. I would be using as much land as possible to increase my yield, to increase my income. But in fact, if he has a ra rainwater harvesting pond there, for the next five years and 10 years, he's gonna be having water security to ensure that he can have long-term financially viable crops but he simply doesn't have the data and information to hand to make those decisions. So I'm not surprised he made those decisions. On the issue of wastewater, um, you know, it's shocking that 80% of all wastewater globally is discharged into freshwater sources and oceans without being treated, 80%. And it's even more shocking when you think of the opportunity of actually collecting, treating, and reusing that wastewater. You think of the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and the water that is embedded within that wastewater. There's a huge opportunity there to tap into it, to use the water and to use the, um, the nutrients in there for agricultural purposes, for example. So if there's one area where I think we can accelerate progress in the coming years, it's around wastewater and reusing it and closing the loop um, in industrial processes, but also between industry and municipalities as well. Uh, some of the countries have tried uh, a model where municipalities and uh, industries are tying up together where the wastewater generated for, after domestic use is being uh, given to industries who recycle it and use it. Um, uh, would you have some examples around that? And is that a feasible model for uh, even a country like India to look at? Probably the best example that springs to mind is from Brazil. Um, there's a, a Brazilian company called Braskem. It's a chemical company, Petrochemicals. Um, in 2012, um, they partnered to build what was at the time the biggest wastewater reuse plant in Latin America. They partnered with an engineering company and the public utility of Sao Paulo called um, Sabesp. Um, Braskem required um, uh, water for various processing purposes. So they came together with the engineering firm and the public utility and said, well, if we can build a wastewater reuse plant, we will sign a 41-year contract to buy that reused water off you 
once it's in situ. And that guarantees that we have independence in our water supply. We don't have to draw from freshwater sources, which can then go to public for potable purposes. And the public-private model that was implemented there was, was essentially a 49-51% split between financing of public and private. But I think the key to making that work was that long-term view, a 41-year commitment from industry to say that we will be the customer, we will pay you regularly for water for our purposes. What happened since 2012 is other industries crowded in and that reuse plant is at its maximum capacity and particularly around the drought in Sao Paulo a few years ago where um, they were really um, uh, had problems in terms of delivering potable water. If that wasn't in place, that would have been completely exasperated and really would have hit the economy very hard could be something that India can look at, uh, especially from the industry's uh, perspective. Uh, Mr. Sharma, uh, you know, talking of industry, you represent one of the largest conglomerates um, in the country. Uh, what are some of the sustainable solutions that the group, the Tata Group, is looking at at this point in time uh, when it comes to sustainability on water? Um, and also uh, about the point that Tom was mentioning, does it work well for industries like yours to, you know, kind of tie in with the government to uh, take the water, uh, recycle it, and use it for industry? I think the Tatas have been very, very proactive, and we look at sustainability with a very wide prism. And water is, of course, a very important subset. So if I just take a few minutes to take you through the journey at the Tatas, in 2010, when Mr. Uh, Tata was at the helm, Mr. Ratan Tata was at the helm of the Tata Group, we formulated a climate policy. And around 2012, we had the Tata Sustainability Group, which came into existence, which I head now as the Group Chief Sustainability Officer. This was a center of excellence. And we looked at sustainability in terms of 15 key performance indicators and 12 thrust areas. These thrust areas were around environment, which was water, waste, carbon. They were around governance. They were around uh, issues related to community engagement. And in all these areas, we did a baseline assessment across all our group companies. We compared it with industry benchmarks. We compared it with global benchmarks. And we decided that over the next five years, this is where directionally we will head. So I think a lot of our progress has been, we publish every year now, a state of the sustainability report at the Tata Group, which is, of course, a restricted document which enables the top leadership to take a look at how we are moving forward in each of these areas which we have identified for priority action. And while environment, which includes, as I said, carbon, which is a major thrust area, and water, which is another major thrust area, but Tatas are probably the only corporate group in India where when we look at community services, and there are three clusters around which we look at community services. One is volunteering, one is disaster response, and the other is the CSR. Now, in disaster response, we have a very structured, institutionalized process, and I think that's the only corporate group in India. And we have about 120 crores tied up in seven disaster responses, and we are into relief and rehabilitation. So as I said, we take a very broad uh, view of the way we manage. Now, a lot of our businesses are agri-based. Tata Coffee, Tata Global Beverages, etc. cetera. Uh, Indian hotels, again, um, hotels are huge water guzzlers, and therefore, it's necessary for us, not only from an environmental point of view, not only from the community point of view, but also from a business point of view, to ensure that there's water security over the long run. And therefore, all our companies did a water footprint assessment, again, as part of this policy. And we set internal targets. And uh, a lot of our work uh, revolves around, I think when we talk about the water crisis in India, nobody talks about supply source sustainability. Right. 
and nobody talks about taking an integrated approach to water management, especially at the watershed level. So aquifers and watersheds are really neglected. So if I give you an example of Tata Steel, and all our business assets around the Jharkhand area. So we did a watershed assessment of the Suburna Rekha River water basin in association with CII Triveni. Now, obviously, we are not government, but we are collaborators. We cannot uh, kind of take responsibility for the watershed as a whole. But when we do a watershed mapping, we do realize that in terms of projections, what will be the projected inflows, outflows, and how do you minimize water use? And how do you increase the efficiency of water use? Right. So that's giving a broad prism of where the Tatas are in terms of our sustainability imperatives. Uh, you asked a question, and here we also talked about uh, private-public partnerships, especially in the water space. Right. Now, if you look at the experience in India, I think in terms of absolute numbers, uh, private uh, public partnerships in the water space have been uh, very minimal as compared to the overall universe in India mm. of PPP projects. Right. In terms of investments, they have been even lower. Mm. We started with this somewhere in the mid 90s. And we had the experience of the Karnataka government, where there were three cities which went on to this. If I remember correctly, it was uh, Dharwar, Hubli, Belgaum. Uh, they did it on a demonstration basis. Hmm. Over the years, it's been tried. Earlier, it was tried in terms of bulk augmentation of water supply. Then it went into more into operation and management and I think it's been a mixed bag, and as we have moved ahead, uh, there have been learning experiences which mm -hmm. have been uh, kind of incorporated in the India story of PPPs. Mm -hmm. But the broader point that I would like to make here is that if you look at water, water is politically a very sensitive issue. Water, again, we've all agreed that the pricing of water does not reflect the value, value of water. Of water. Right. It's a, it's a public good, and therefore everyone thinks that he has a right to it. And the perceptual issue is that the moment the private sector gets into it, they are there for profits. So there's a huge perceptual issue. So what I would think in terms of PPPs is that you have to ensure that when you're working out the structure and every project is different, it cannot be a one-size-fits-all. So absolutely. So the first thing I would say is that whenever a PPP project in water is being structured, it's got to be based on whatever are the local conditions. Hmm. And sure, sir. the risk allocation has to be fair. There has to be skin in the game. Hmm. There's got to be a win-win for both government. There's got to be a win-win for the corporate sector. Industry as well. No, uh, obviously, because you're not going to get in otherwise. A a absolutely. Uh, slightly short on time, I'll take a quick word from Dr. Dua, and then I want to come to Kavita on the financing part um, before I wrap up this uh, panel. We have just about a dozen examples in the entire country. Mm -hmm. A French company called Veolia was the first one to come. They did some work in Delhi. They worked in Nagpur a city in Maharashtra, and a Tata's outfit, and some others. But in the case of water, where the participation of private sector, and much more the community, and that also I would like to see it as being considered a PPP, because at the end of the day, distribution is the one where we need them. Water production, water treatment, water carrying, probably they are economies of scale and there the resources of the state are necessary. But when it's the decentralized, getting the water across, much more than businesses, I think it is the village bodies, call them panchayats, self-help groups, who have to now, particularly in this drinking water scheme which we are talking about, become very active. The mission itself lays down that the assets will be built by government but entire maintenance 
including recovery of money from the users for the water would have to be done by somebody else. Yes, right. Kavita, quickly. That's the key focus of the Jal Jeevan mission, right. Perhaps, yeah. where uh, the summities that are being set up, I mean, 50% are going to have women in it. They're going to be trained into masonry and other targets. Mm. Uh, each of these summities has to set up their own uh, cost recovery tariff, etc. Yeah. So community participation, I mean, is... It's Waste given. and water are to two be. aspects where without community, no one can move the needle on, on the ground. But, you know, to move any program on ground, you need financing. And Kavita, can you come in here very briefly on how can we look at certain alternative sources of funding to, for water programs? And, you know, Pierre set the context by saying that, you know, you have to monetize water at some level. I think we really need to move from just looking at pricing water to valuing water. Uh, I think we also spoke about Jal Jeevan Mission, Atal Bujal Yojana and the Pradhan Mantri Kishi Sanchai Yojana. We are also talking about raising tariffs and taxes. Uh, we also have CSR monies, right? But I think all these monies and all these budgets and all these sources of financing put together is not enough to finance the gap. I talks about a gap of 2.5 trillion US in developing economies alone to finance SDGs. A large portion of this is for water. So I think we really need to move beyond traditional bank financing and beyond the subsidy-driven models to more newer and innovative ways of financing, like impact investing, uh, looking at alternative investment funds, blended finance. There's also pension funds and insurance companies which manage large long-term sums of money. And I think it's important that as a as a, as a group, which is the financial services industry, because I think there's a fair bit of asymmetry between the water sector in terms of what are the other options available for financing and the financial services sector. There's a lot of money going to education, healthcare, uh, even agriculture, but why not water? And I think water is virtually the docking station for all as SDGs, as it were. So I think uh, there is a very strong need and a case for uh, building the financial case for water and linking it with the economic and social case. I think all of us agree that uh, there is a strong case for, um, you know, the, the economic and social case is very strong, but linking and aligning it to the financial case is what is required. So building an investment case for water, for agri separately, for industrial water separately, uh, looking at also, you know, increasing governance and um, efficiency between the private sector and the government to work together in a collaborative manner is required, but I think d tapping into these alternative sources of financing is very much of the hour. Right. Uh, Pierre, last word. Uh, BNP has an aqua fund too, um, although it's under your CSR program. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, bringing it into the actual revenue business and not keeping it under CSR? Yeah, exactly. We have to move the water out of uh, what is called a philanthropy mode to a, to a business mode. Right. And uh, to do that, there are a few things uh, that I can say. I will share, there are many examples that are starting, but I want to say that with the exception maybe that has been t explained uh, for, for, for Tata Group here, there are very few corporates who consider water as a priority. And uh, first of all, we need to bring the priority into the economic players. So. Why? Because there is this perception that is a given thing and, uh, and the people don't do that. First of all, the people do not see this as a risk. So the people need to install this as a risk. It has been explained clearly that. And so first, the bank. The bank have not included water as a risk to follow yet. So it's coming, it will come like the rest, but climate change is already one. But so water will be probably the other one that we have to start to measure as a risk when we deal and we make loans. So that's the first things that I wanted to say. So we have to look at the risk, but after that we have also to include, if we want to attract the interest of the investor, as a, an opportunity. This is why we, we have to, in, one of the first things we have to do is to include water as part of a project. If we talk in agriculture, in order to finance commodities, more and more we are financing landscape. And landscape will include the water as one of the subjects to treat it. So it's not only to take care about the agriculture producing more productivity, but it's also to make sure that it will use less water. Because when you do economics and PL, you make more revenues, but you also make more money if you have less cost.
Right. So we need to bring the cost side of it. And so we can include that through a project. So now when we, we finance some farming project, we are including electricity because it's important. We can make it by renewables, but we can also include the less use of water. I can give you a, a way also. We can make loans, and we call them uh, sustainable link loans. If the, the, the rate will diminue, will be less, if the people achieve a certain level of savings of water. So we give incentive for the people to do that. So there are many mechanisms that we can start to put in place. But last but not least, what I want to say, most of the solution will come by rethinking the way that we are mixing private, public, and philanthropic money. And this is where we have to rethink about some model there. We call it blended finance. And there are plenty of new schemes that could be put in place. I don't think we have the time to talk about it here, but that's where we have a lot of things to do. And valuing water like we have to value anything which is nature-based solution. Right. India has a water... Just to, you see, whatever be the nature of the finance, whether it's purely government, whether it's a mix of government and uh, the private sector, or whether it's blended finance, you do need an adequate rate of return. If that's not going to come, the financing is not going to come. Absolutely. And I think that that is something which has to be a core apart from issues like a political buy-in, a community buy-in. But a return on investment has to be there for actually investments in asset creation. And that is, that is, that is where water needs to move from philanthropy to actually making money for people so that they start investing in building those programs. But like India has a water crisis on my panel, I right now have a time crisis. Uh, I, if there is time, can we take one or two questions from the audience, if, if there are any, otherwise... Um Okay. I would like to ask a question that whether uh, the resources, when the, uh, this uh, water efficient devices, which are very much costly today uh, in India, need to be subsidized or bring down so the farmer can afford that and access that to use efficient water. So uh, I need to do the panels. Uh, Who do you direct the question? Anyone in particular or we just... Uh... Anyone can. Okay. Micro irrigation programs uh, in the government have such subsidized system for drip irrigation, etc. Today, I give you an example of the state of Gujarat, which was not known for being uh, agriculturally very progressive. But for seven to eight years, when the current prime minister was the chief minister, he brought in a very novel scheme, and one must give him credit for that as well. He first prescribed that there has to be a soil cart. Every farm must get, farmer must get for his holding a soil cart. The soil cart is prepared by a team of experts who visited farm after farm over seven or eight years and said, your, your land is suitable for X, Y, Z crops. And then a subsidized drip irrigation system or a sprinkler irrigation system with the help of Israel. Israel's the drip, drip irrigation system was, done, was more or less completed in the entire state by the time Mr. Modi moves to the center. <coughs> I think there is a lesson in it that if you are yourself conscious about the use of water, you are willing to move to a crop which is suitable for your soil, then the government will chip in with a subsidy for you to install a water-saving device like the one which you mentioned. Okay, any, any, okay one, one more question we'll take um, at the end. My question is on the point that Tom made earlier about 80% of the water being pumped into the sea, right? And so my question to anybody on the panel is, can you talk about water stand alone without talking about sanitation and hygiene? And on that thought, uh, you know, talk about like centralized, decentralized wat wastewater management systems. 
Uh, Tom, would you want to take it with your experience of working with uh, uh, various urban local bodies across the world and the programs that you would be doing yeah. um, uh, on the ladies' question? Yeah, happy to. You know, the last, um, since I've been working in, in the water sector 20 years or so, there used to be, and there still is, the group who took up, talk about water and sanitation and the group who talk about water resources. Now, what SDG 6 done was to actually bring that together. SDG 6 talks about water, sanitation, water resources, for example. What we haven't seen are those communities those organizations actually come together just like SDG 6 has. So if you're talking about drinking water supply, you've got to be talking about water resources. If you're talking about wastewater, you've got to be talking about sanita sanitation in a very integrated way. We, we don't see that yet at the policy level within government, at departmental level within government, and even within the water and sanitation sector, we don't see that cross-fertilization of thinking. So I think that, that's absolutely critical. In government of India, I mean, there's a little bit of a change in the sense that now you see drinking water and sanitation has become part of one, one ministry. So that those silos are break. tending to break down. Mm. And there is this thing about convergence. I personally don't think that you can separate water from sanitation in other areas because they're hugely integrated. And the moment you start to take an integrated view, you get better solutions. Right. And especially if you're talking of water uh, from the sustainable development goals, you really cannot segregate it because uh, I was reading somewhere that the impact of water crisis is largely, uh, you know, the burden is being uh, taken up by children and women, and which is where the other sustainable development goals also kick in. So water is something you cannot really segregate in, in one silo. Um, I think we really run out of time. We'll have the panelists to answer all your questions uh, later. I would like to end uh, on one line that poet W.H. Auden had said earlier. People can live a lifetime without love, but not without a glass of water. So thank you.